This is Shoshone Falls, a major waterfall on the Snake River in southern Idaho, not too far away from the town of Twin Falls. Uh, this is one of the more iconic landmarks in our region. Um, it's known as the, the Niagara of the West. Uh, it's actually a larger waterfall in terms of its vertical drop than Niagara Falls. It's about 212 feet uh, total drop here. And we're looking at Shoshone Falls uh, early in June. Uh, it's probably what I would call kind of like getting into like medium flow. So as impressive as this may look, it actually can get quite a bit larger in terms of the amount of water going over the falls. Uh, when we really get large periods of runoff and releases, the waterfall actually starts uh, over here on the right side uh, and spans uh, all the way over to where the falls are at, on the left side here. So it actually gets a lot bigger and more impressive, but I chose to come on this day so it's not so loud. If I was here when the falls were really raging, uh, it would be quite loud and maybe difficult to hear. Um, and so I want to actually do a two-part video on Shoshone Falls. I want to use this video to look mainly at the waterfall itself, some of its history, a little bit of the geology here as well, obviously. And then with part two, we're going to look at some of the rocks in the canyon up close. We'll talk about them here. You can see them nicely exposed on the north wall of the canyon. But then when our, with the second part of this video series, we'll, I'll ride my bike back up the road here. And there's some nice exposures along the road coming in where you can see these up close, put your hand on them. So we'll kind of go from there. So um, Shoshone Falls is part of the Snake River. The Snake River begins at the south end of Yellowstone National Park. It flows along the eastern base of the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. Uh, and then it turns west, cuts through a pretty impressive canyon. And then it enters Idaho and goes into the Snake River Plain. And it meanders through the Snake River Plain uh, it's been pushed around by volcanoes, so the current path of the Snake River is largely predicated by the eruptions of these shield volcanoes over the last four or five million years or so. So every time a volcano erupts, it pours lava into uh, the Snake River Canyon. The lava goes downhill, and if there's enough lava, it can dam up the canyon, disrupt the river, and cause the river to flow somewhere else. So as as amazing as this landscape is, and we have a, a, about a 500 foot deep canyon here, this is just sort of the, the last iteration of where the Snake River has flowed in the Snake River Plain. Uh, I have another video uh, near Pillar Falls that kind of looks at some of the ancient channel deposits of the Snake River and some of the lavas filling it. Um, so the Snake River has a cool story with the origin of the name, and the story goes that the early explorers that came here and were communicating with the Native Americans, um, they're trying to communicate about this big river, this big canyon and this big river, and so they're not speaking the same language, they're, uh, so they're resorting to hand gestures for the most part. And as they're talking about this river, uh, the, this, the hand gesture the natives are using is something kind of like this, you know, this kind of back and forth sideways motion. That was interpreted by those early explorers to represent snakes, so they called it the Snake River. But actually what they were referring to with that hand motion was the salmon. So the salmon would migrate all the way upstream along the Snake River up to this point. Shoshone Falls was the furthest eastward or upstream point that the salmon could move uh, from the ocean in the Snake River system. So this was a barrier to upstream travel for those migrating salmon. Kind of a cool part of that story. Uh, let's go over here and look at some of the layers in the canyon though. So we've got this massive layer along the bottom edge of the canyon that forms the waterfall. And as we kind of move around to the north end here, we can see kind of by the, the power plant here that it makes up this lower, maybe third or so of the canyon. This is all rhyolite. This, is, this rock is about eight million years old or so. And this rock formed when this region of Idaho sat right above the Yellowstone hotspot. So the exact same magma plume that's underneath Yellowstone uh, was underneath the Twin Falls region about eight to 10 million years ago. And it erupted sometimes explosively and we have ash deposits nearby that uh, bear record of that. At other times, uh, maybe after a big eruption, that thick, sticky, pasty lava, think of it like toothpaste in terms of its consistency, would just sort of well up out of the ground 
and ooze outwards <coughs> and form these rhyolitic lava flows. So this is the, the top layer we see related to that Yellowstone hotspot underneath the Twin Falls region. Luckily, there's been enough erosion by the Snake River that it's intersected this layer and exposed it. If you look along the top of that layer, you can see it's kind of irregular, kind of like it's kind of low over here by the power plant. Uh, and then it comes up a little bit higher. Um, and so it's irregular. That's the old topographic surface uh, above the rhyolite after we moved off the hotspot and the rhyolite phase of volcanic activity ended. Then this middle layer right here, the kind of lighter colored layer, you might even from a distance to be able to see it, it kind of has chunks in it. And if you can't see that, I'll show that in the next video when we're closer on the road. That's a layer of breccia. So that's got big, up to some cases, you know, a meter size class of the rhyolite. It's totally made out of big chunks of the rhyolite. And it represents either an erosional phase of uh, probably an erosional phase of the rhyolite breaking up into pieces. Some have interpreted it as an auto breccia associated with the rhyolitic lava flow. Um, I think it's a separate unit. I think there's enough erosion along the bottom that it, and it, it doesn't look to me like a, a, a rhyolite uh, auto breccia. So we've got this uh, erosional layer of the breakup of the rhyolite lava flow right here in the middle, and then a really sharp pronounced line uh, that you can kind of see right about here. And then above that is basalt. So then we get into these more fluid lava eruptions from the nearby shield volcanoes. These are as old as maybe like three to two million years. Uh, and then some of the high ones there down river on the rim, I believe those are about 95,000 years old. And then of course, if you get to the, the craters of the moon area, they become even younger. And so a nice record here with three chapters to the story, the rhyolite eruption, when this area was over the Yellowstone hotspot about six to eight million years ago, a period of erosion when uh, the rhyolite was being eroded, broken up into pieces, uh, maybe collapse of the, maybe if there were calderas here, the caldera walls to form the breccia layer, and then the upper layer there forming the basalt, a different phase of volcanic activity, more fluid types of eruptions, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and so pretty cool, the, the geology here, uh, at Shoshone Falls. The rhyolite's really resistant. It has a lot of quartz in it. That's why it forms this abrupt drop and this waterfall here. Of course, like a lot of waterfalls, this is actively being eroded back or upstream as the water moves over the top of the cliff face there. Uh, the sediment in the water chips away at it and erodes it backwards. And I guess the last thing I'll mention on the Snake River is even though this is a, a pretty impressive site here, even when it's uh, flowing at a much higher rate, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the Snake River, like a lot of rivers in the West, are kind of like just a, a shell of what they used to be. The Snake River, even though it's pretty impressive here at Shoshone Falls, this river is, there's a heavy demand put on this river. It's diverted into canal systems for agriculture uh, and irrigating the area, industry. Uh, the water is diverted to a power plant down here at the bottom, so it's generating electricity. And so if we were here, you know, over a hundred years ago, before the development of this area, right now, early June, man, this whole thing would just be raging. You probably couldn't be able to hear me. Uh, and it would just be quite impressive. And so just an important historical point to recognize that Shoshone Falls, even in its, you know, spring, early summer splendor, uh, is just sort of a, a shell of its former self. And uh, although some wet years, we do get a glimpse of what it might've looked like during those high water years. So. Uh, so this is part one. I'll go get on my bike and post another video to show you these rocks up close along the road uh, just to the east of here uh, at Shoshone Falls in South Central Idaho. Okay, I'm uh, maybe, I don't know, a quarter mile or so just east of the overlook for Shoshone Falls. Uh, here in South Central Idaho, the Canyon Rim Trail kind of winds up its way. And this is the second part of a two-part series on the rocks around Shoshone Falls. So the first part, we kind of had the big picture view of the falls and looked across the canyon at the rock layers. And along this section of roadway here on the road that goes down to Shoshone Falls, we can actually look at these rocks in a little bit of detail up close. So I wanted to take some time to do that. 
And we'll start with the, the lowermost rock layer, which if you watch part one is the rhyolites, the eight, six to eight million year old rhyolite that formed when this area was over the, um, the Yellowstone hotspot at that time. So uh, this is probably the best outcrop along the road here. Uh, it's a dark rock and to the naked eye, it kind of looks a lot like basalt. It looks like uh, a more, the more common volcanic rock we have here in South Central Idaho. But a couple things interesting here, you can actually see some, some crude flow banding in here. So you can see some, some crude layering in this volcanic rock that shows a little bit of how it formed. Uh, but if we get up here kind of close, we can see there's some small little crystals in here. And in fact, this, this dark rock uh, is in places kind of glassy. It's probably a little hard to tell with the lighting and the camera set up here. But if you look at pieces of this, I'll see if I can find one on the ground. This one's not too bad. Um, there's places in here where you can see that it's a little bit glassy. Uh, it's not really focusing well. That's not too bad. But you can see a nice crystal here in the middle. These are crystals of plagioclase and potassium feldspar uh, in the rock. So these are feldspar crystals that cooled underground and then as the volcanic material was carried to the surface, uh, it, it was they were carried with that material. Uh, the rest of the material surrounding these light colored crystals is black and kind of glassy and in places might even look and resemble a little bit like obsidian. And so this is actually what we typically see along the upper edge of a rhyolite lava flow or the upper carapace. And this is a rock that again, fundamentally has black obsidian, true obsidian, but it's riddled with these crystals as well. So this is not the kind of obsidian that you would uh, be able to like nap or, or form into, you know, some sort of arrowhead or anything like that. This is a rock called vitrophere. So vitro, uh, means glassy fear not fear like scared but p-h-y-r-e fearic means crystal so literally this translates into glassy crystals this black rock here so this is from the uh the lavas that formed again at the time of the yellowstone hotspot uh we're gonna go up the hill a little bit here we've got some big cliffs above us here that we'll look at as well but up here along the road is a little waterfall and a road cut that nicely shows the second layer. Again, if you watch part one, we had three different layers in our, our canyon wall. <clears throat> and the middle layer is a rock called breccia. And breccia is just fragmented angular particles that are large, so gravel size or larger. Here's our little waterfall coming down from the Jerkies Lake area. And as we kind of come over in this region here, we can see the big cliffs above, that's the basalt. That's the top of the three layer uh, cake. But in here, along the road cut here, we get a nice view of the basalt. And so we can see there's huge blocks in here. That block's about, about a meter in size, all sorts of other material in here. Uh, and it's all made out of, we can step across. No, that's wet. Uh, it's all made out of this black, the same rock we looked at, this vitrophere, with these white crystals in it and the black material. But we can see it's unsorted, unsorted, uh, a random chaotic assemblage of this rock. Big chunks, little chunks, all mixed together. It doesn't really show any rounding for the most part. It's pretty angular blocks. And so there's a couple interpretations here that make sense. This could be, uh, it's been interpreted by some as an auto breccia. So the outer carapace of that rhyolitic lava flow, as it sort of rolls over on itself, it breaks up into pieces. Um, or it could just be some erosional product. So it could be landslides or cliffs failing, uh, rock fall off the edges of these rhyolite cliffs. But either way, this this is the last gasp or the last stage of the Yellowstone hotspot erupting in the Twin Falls area. If we kind of look just above it though, and I'll get up there a little bit closer. So again, we've got the basalt up above. So those lava flows forming, which we'll look at here in a second. We've got the breccia down here. And if I can step across the water and get up here a little bit, there's actually a really interesting layer. It's only a foot or so thick, but we can see some more rounded rocks embedded. 
And we can see that the rock type changes. Again, down below we get uh, these, these rhyolites, these vitrophiers in, uh, embedded in the breccia. But then there's this layer with fairly rounded particles. They look quite different. Uh, and so this looks like a, a pretty obvious stream deposit. Some sort of stream was flowing through here at some point in time and depositing maybe a foot or two of sediment uh, in the area. Um, so we're gonna walk up a little bit to where we can see these a little better. So as we walk up, again, we can see the breccia layer here, a little bit of that stream gravel. Uh, it's pretty poorly sorted, but it's got mostly these round particles. And then this nice sharp contact here with the overlying uh, basalt. And I want to show you one kind of cool feature that we see at the base of the basalt. So right here, again, we can see this nice sharp contact. Uh, and if you can see well enough, at the bottom of the basalt, there's these kind of like lines going off to the side. And it's a little hard to get there because there's some water in front of me. Um, but what those are, remember this basalt formed as a lava flow. So this was a more Hawaiian style low viscosity lava flow from about i think these are about two million years ago so if you think about it where is that lava going to go well it's going to go to the lowest point in the landscape which is where the streams and the water tends to be so we've got this stream deposit here with these rounded particles and then this sharp line and what this represents is the lava actually going into the stream perhaps and cooling quite quickly and so we get these bubbles what we call vesicles right along the bottom of the lava flow. I'm gonna come back here and see if it's a little easier to see or if I can get a little bit closer over here. Yeah, you can kind of see the same thing over here. They might be a little bit more obvious, but you can see some of these gas bubbles right along the base of that lava flow there. And what's interesting about these bubbles in this particular spot, is if you think about these gas bubbles rising, um, there's water flashing to steam as the lava pours over the soil or maybe a little bit of water. And so even though there's, you know, 20 feet of lava in terms of its thickness, the, there's enough water, vapor and water to overcome the pressure of the lava and form these bubbles we see along the bottom. And all these bubbles here, all these vesicles are tilted in that direction to the right. And so what that indicates is as the, as the bubbles were forming uh, and trying to escape vertically through the lava, the lava was still moving to the right. So these are what we call um, imbricated or inclined pipe vesicles, meaning that they're slanted and not vertical. And what's cool about them is they, they show us the direction of the lava moving at the time the lava erupted. So pretty cool a little addition to the story there. So nice exposure along this road that heads down to Shoshon Falls. Um, a lot of people whiz by here. It's not a good place to park, but you can stop just down below and then walk back up. But it nicely shows uh, the uppermost basalt layers, which are the youngest layers in the canyon from shield volcanoes and more kind of passive eruptions. Uh, the little stream layer just below, the larger breccia layer, which is fragmented large angular blocks of the rhyolite and the vitrophere from the Yellowstone hotspot. And then down at Shoshone Falls, and the first place I stopped is the actual rhyolite vitrophere itself from the Yellowstone eruption. So kind of a quick little look there at some of the rock layers down here at Shoshone Falls right along the road.